All right, today we're looking at uh, the computer maintenance. It's our lesson four for computer literacy. And uh, we're looking at uh, basically simple maintenance issues that can crop up, uh, how to maintain hardware just basically Okay, upgrade and replace components, perform preventative maintenance, request specialized maintenance, okay, when you should do that. Uh, anyway, I have comments about that. Uh, your vocabulary listed there, okay, and uh, we'll cover all those words today. Okay, so basically a computer requires some regular maintenance. It'll run a long time without ever doing anything to it. Uh, but, and, you know, if you want it to last a long time, then, and we're talking mainly about towers and desktop units. You know, if you got a problem with your laptop, not much you can do uh, unless you take a class on computer maintenance and kind of feel a little more confident about that. Uh, or just dive in and if you got one you can experiment on, you know. But usually laptops just don't get that dirty or have that much uh, maintenance required. One of the main things that's overlooked by most of us that have any kind of desktop unit is managing your cables, keeping those neat or at least out of the way. Uh, we just, uh, Shelby just told us about student rolling over a cable in a classroom and shutting her system off. And uh, I don't know if any of you have ever experienced, you know, getting your foot hung on one of those cables in your, at, your, at your desk and pulling a cable loose, you know, whether it's a data or a power cable. And uh, it's not a fire hazard if you leave it like that. I don't think you got to worry about that kind of thing but uh, it doesn't create heat in the cables. Uh, so mainly it's just being able to work on it easily if you have to make any changes and uh, keeping it out of your feet. Uh, and it's just easier to work on if your cables are tied up, old twist ties or fancy Velcro cables or whatever you want to use to uh, keep them organized and together. Some people get some of that uh, corrugated plastic, looks like drain tile plastic, tubing that you put in your yard, field tile, but it's small stuff, you know, it's got split on the side. Some people use that, put the cords inside of that. Your keyboard and your mouse, uh, occasionally you should just take your keyboard, I'm not going to do it to mine, but you just, uh, one of the quick ways, you know, if you like to eat at your keyboard, like a lot of people do, uh, and then there's other things that fall off of your body into the crevices of the keyboard, okay, from various orifices and, uh, and off your head, okay, hair and other things, uh, crumbs and whatever falls down in there and just dust. So you can turn it upside down, tap it on the desk, you know, and get major stuff out of it like that. And then you can buy some compressed air to blow in there and to blow out the dust. Inkjet printers uh, have their own maintenance routines that they do. A lot of times, every time you turn them on, uh, they will. And then, of course, you can go to the properties and run a little maintenance on it. And it will clean the, uh, the heads, the print head. There's little kits even that uh, you can buy to, to clean those out. You can also, it's not mentioned, but you can also use that dust and spray that duster and spray out the paper dust that collects in there. Eventually your wheels and then dust from your uh, home or office gets down in there and gets on the wheels and your paper doesn't feed right. Okay. Laser printers a little bit different. They tend to have that toner, you know, that comes out of it pretty easily. A lot of times when you're switching it out, there's always a little bit that comes out. And of course, just in the way it runs, some dust is going to get outside of the toner cartridge 
So basically a, a good small uh, camel hair brush will work good. Don't really recommend spraying air into a laser printer, you know, taking the cartridge out and spraying it with some of that uh, compressed air can because it just blows that toner everywhere, you know, and it gets it in other places that it n normally wouldn't and uh, can get on the rollers and just so uh, there's a transfer sponge roller that you don't touch, okay, leave that alone, that's part of the mechanism, you get some little oil on it there and you won't be happy with the printing results. Computer memory, uh, RAM's made up of small memory chips that looks much like that, that hasn't changed in almost since they were invented, okay, they pretty much those chip boards look like that and uh, they're installed in slots on your computer. I have over here, and I probably won't pick up the microphone way over there, but anyway, I have a, uh, an older tower opened up that you can look inside of, and you can see the, uh, the little RAM boards that are in here, and they've got little snaps that hold it in, so I can just pass that one around. They're all different prices. It's pretty easy to upgrade those yourself. You know, if you want to add more RAM to your tower, that's pretty easy to do. You'll just need to research what type uh, your computer requires. Uh, it varies with age. At first, computer memory for your newest towers or newest laptops is going to be very expensive. When you buy the laptop, want to buy as much RAM as you can afford at the beginning. It's included in the price and it's cheaper that way. If you wait till a month or two after you buy it, it'll be very expensive. Then if you uh, wait a very long time and you've got an older machine and you try to upgrade it, it's going to be expensive then. At some point in between those two points from its birth until the almost end of its life, uh, it'll go up and down, but generally the price will come down. It'll start to go back up, okay, uh, as it gets older. So we talked about the, the keyboards. Most of the keyboards, there's been some real ergonomic ones come out, but they are so weird to operate, kind of hard to get used to. The ones where they're kind of split in half and turned sideways so that your wrists don't have to bend like this, okay? They, uh, you know, actually turn the, anybody, anybody seen that kind of keyboard? Seen those? It's kind of shaped like a U, okay? They, they do feel good, but man, if you're a typer like me, and I'm not a schooled typer, I mean, we took it way back in high school, but, you know, I'll use this hand over here, and I'll use this hand over there, you know, I'm not a purist, <laughs> and uh, not like my dad that used these, you know, his two fingers and his thumb, that's what he typed with, you know on his old royal typewriter, manual one, snap, 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 okay. Anyway, ergonomic keyboards are good. Uh, they're not taken off in popularity. The keyboard you have sitting in front of you, that's pretty much when you buy a keyboard in a store, that's what you're going to get. Of course, a wireless keyboard is very common nowadays. A uh, little more expensive, but not a whole lot more. Of course, a mouse, the maintenance on it, basically just, it just stops working, you know, you throw the mouse away and get another one, okay? A touchpad that's on a, on a computer or on a keyboard, some of them, there's no maintenance to do on those, okay? And if they fail, you replace the keyboard or have to send the 
laptop in and get it uh, get it repaired if, if you are a touchpad user. Okay. Then there's the issue of disk uh, fra defragmentation or the fragmentation of a disk. As you're seeing there on the screen, uh, this is a uh, artist representation of uh, how data is stored on a hard disk and on a floppy disk. I, I really don't have a, a picture to show you how it's stored in a USB drive, but it does get fragmented in there as well. So basically it's in sectors, all your data. And uh, new data that you put on here is not necessarily going to go in the next available physical space. It's going to go in the next logically physical space on, the, on there. And, uh, and then when you delete a file, it leaves a hole. And so the computer controller, the hard disk controller, will actually store data. This blue right here could be the same file, and it's going to stick the data wherever there's an open spot in a logical location. And uh, so your data just becomes scattered all over it. And uh, it's not as huge of an issue anymore for the hard drive to access, find it and access it and pull that uh, data into your RAM because hard drives have become so blazingly fast. You know, they're spending at over 7,200 RPMs, 7,200 revolutions per minute. Okay, that's like a really fast car engine, okay, running wide open pretty much nowadays. That would be really revving up really fast. It's like holding your accelerator down, getting it up to 7,000 RPMs and leaving it there all the time. It's really running fast. And magically, to me, it finds that data and it's scattered all over, but if it's scattered in 50 places, it takes it extra time to pull it up. So uh, there are disk defragmentation programs that you can run in Windows. Now, I'm not sure how Mac computers handle it. Anybody happen to know? Is there maintenance? Anybody experience that? I don't own a Mac and never have, so I don't really know about that. They don't talk about it very much that I know of in the book. So, at any rate, you can run a program that will remove uh, all the blank spaces. It will also move together uh, the files and put them end to end and close by one another. Get them close as they can to each other. You should uh, check your recycle bin occasionally and uh, remove stuff from there that's taking up space because it kind of holds that uh, even though it's been sent there as trash. Uh, it actually holds a space on the hard drive to keep track of where it is. Now at some point if you're going running real close and you're getting down to like you know you got 100 megabytes left on your hard drive or less in some cases on a you know 100 gigabyte drive you don't have much left well it's going to start going ahead and writing over the top of those files that you've got in your uh, recycle bin or it's going to prompt you and say you know I'm running out of room here You've got to free up some space. So it's a good idea to go in there, check it, look at it, and then clean it out. You can run the uh, disk uh, or system cleanup that uh, should be in your accessories. And system tools. There's the disk defragmenter and then disk cleanup. And uh, I'll tell you what it's going to find because yours truly has not run this in 
quite some time. But it'll go in there and it'll find all the places where you've got files stored that could be deleted, could be gotten rid of. Some of them you want to and some of them you don't. Okay? But uh, to keep your internet browsing fast, it's a, it's a good idea to keep the uh, temporary uh, folder cleaned out. That's a good good thing to do. So it's it's going to take it a while to do it. We'll we'll let that work and keep going. Cookies is another place that you can remove. It's a small text file, very very tiny, but there are tons of them created as you go to different websites, particularly if you have accounts that you use, okay, or you log in to different things, it's going to create cookies from that. It's also, when you visit web pages, it creates cookies. And uh, it's basically identifies uh, what you have looked at and where you have been, okay, uh, in your browser. And then uh, when you go to other websites, they will look at your cookies <laughs> and determine, you know, oh, well, maybe some of this kind of advertising be good for this person. And so that's how you get ads, you know, and pop-ups and then other ads on websites that are kind of tailored to you, okay? So it's kind of good in that way so that you actually see some advertisement that might interest you. And then it's bad because it seems intrusive and seems like, you know, hey, you know, somebody's tracking what I'm doing here. Uh, viruses can grab a hold of the, the cookies and actually compile those and, and uh, use them against you, okay, to cause havoc in your computer. So here's my disk cleanup. It popped up. It says that uh, uh, I don't have any download program files that are eligible to be deleted. Temporary files, 156 megabytes. Well, that's, you know, that's not a whole lot. I could, it's not a, for temporary internet files, it's not so much how much is there, you know, it's what is there, okay? And it could be stuff left where you shut off the computer, power was lost, could be fragmented files in there that uh, can create a, a slow process for the browser when it comes back up. I've got a bunch of thumbnails, setup logs. Let's see what I've got a lot of. Oh, temporary files down here. Let's see what that one, that, that one is. It's not internet. It's temporary files, so it's probably files uh, that I've deleted, uh, programs I have pulled off of my computer. Uh, Usually it deletes this information when you uh, close a program. So apparently that's not been happening a lot on my computer. So I could pick up uh, 3.47 gigabytes. It says I can safely delete those uh, that have not been modified in over a week. So I would kind of have to go to that folder and uh, maybe select. Or you can just dive in, take a plunge, and see what happens delete it, you know, and hope it makes it run faster and better. And uh, the worst thing is you might have to reinstall uh, one of your little programs or something. Probably not going to mess with Office or anything. Okay. So when should you re request specialized maintenance? Uh, if you're replacing this power supply, other electrical components in there, the processor, adding a hard disk, or adding additional RAM. Uh, actually, adding a hard disk and adding RAM, if you're in the technical field, which all of you are going probably technical at some point, you know, you should just try to do it yourself. You know, you, it's not hard to learn how to do. Uh, it is a little scary because it's your personal computer and you're thinking, oh, I'm going to blow this thing. somebody first, maybe, or you can lay down the 30 bucks to have a local uh, computer wizard uh, take a look at it, you usually charge about $30 to give you an estimate on doing hex, you know, whatever it is, to see if they can fix it or they agree to go ahead and do it, then that $30 is waived usually. This is the CPU out of this computer, okay, that little chip there. 
the heat sink. Okay? That's a big heat sink. Okay? So that little chip gets hot. Okay? And uh, so it has to get the heat away from it. It's even got a little funnel, okay, that a little hood that goes over the top of the so that the air, all the air is pulled through it. silver go into the manufacture of computer chips and, uh, and circuit boards. There's a lot of silver in here. Okay. And gold. It's just gold is the best conductor in the world. Okay. It's a little expensive right now. Particularly. Okay. So you can do it yourself. You can change it out. Now getting that chip off of there if you want to replace the CPU is a little task. possible that they're probably ruining that chip. You know, but if the chip is dead, that's okay. And when you buy a new chip for a particular computer, it's going to come with a chip, and it's going to come with a special little glue that you uh, squirt on there and, and attach it to that. But you put the chip in first, you secure it, and then you stick the heat sink down on top of it. There's another heat sink on the video. I think it's the video uh, chip that uh, comes on the, that particular motherboard. So if you're doing any of these things, your first consideration would be, ah, maybe I can do it myself. But then you may want to think about uh, letting the professional look at it. So basically, a uh, computer requires maintenance on a regular schedule. Uh, you want to maintain your cables well, check them periodically, you know, see if they've been damaged, if you're just letting them lay in the floor and the vacuum's running over it and the cat's chewing on it and your feet are rubbing against it, you probably want to check them. And you probably want to protect them in some way and get them up off the floor and organize them. Uh, the keyboard, we just be sure we get the dust out of it about every six months. We clean a mouse. Uh, I don't know why they're even talking about a roller mouse. I mean, I don't even know if you can even buy one. So the optical mouse, like you have, okay, you just got to clean the feet. Clean the, the mouse's feet every now and then with a little claw, okay? Printer maintenance, uh, self-cleaning, most of them, occasionally. If you use them a lot, they could get a lot of extra stuff in them if you have a dusty environment. Clean a laser when you change out the toner cartridge by dusting out the cavity with a little brush and maybe a lint-free uh, cloth. Your, uh, you can add RAM. That's the best thing you can do to add overall value. I really didn't mention that, but in summary, I am. That's what you want to do to add value to your computer and buy it at the beginning. Okay, all computers slow down, not as much as they used to, I can tell you. We run them in here, all this graphic software that we use and everything, we don't really see a degradation, and we hardly ever do any defragmentation. But I think if you do a lot of music, you do a lot of pictures uh, or documents, uh, doing a lot of that, or more than one person is doing a lot of that on the same computer, you're going to need to do some maintenance on it, maintenance on it every now and then. And then some of them we just talked about are not suitable for the average consumer. And that's the end of the show.